cutting David's hair. I'm in the middle of cutting David's hair. We're all here this weekend for a uh, master class, V76 in Miami, our June class. And David showed up and I said, you need to be uh, groomed a little bit more. So he caught me in the middle of getting him done before, of course, the class starts a little bit later. And um, just tightening, tightening up his sides, bringing things in, um, in the short and the back and trying to build up a little bit of weight. He's trying to grow his top out. He's been wearing it really short for a long time and we're trying to get a little bit more length up there. So in order to do that, we're creating just a little bit more length and a little bit more of a weight line on the side. And I'm just dusting him off. So while I'm doing this, I think we're gonna be here for about half an hour and I encourage you to fire away questions. We're gonna be talking about some of the products, why they were created in the first place. Of course, what I'm gonna be using on him um, the different textures of hair, why I would use what I'm using, and even going over some of the products like the shaving and the skin stuff that, uh, that we might not have a chance to use on David. But just talking a little bit about what the overall line means and, and really what grooming means. So feel free to ask questions and take advantage. If you do have the time and you're watching, um, fire away. So, Vaughn, I, I have the first question. Um, how did you get started doing hair? Um, I guess in 1976, I just had a curiosity about it, and I took my brother down in the basement and started, I thought it would be easy, so I started cutting his hair and uh, chopped him up and, and found out very quickly that it's really not that easy to cut someone's hair. And I was in a lot of trouble with my mother when she got home, because my, my brother looked pretty ridiculous. At least his uh, fringe bang area looked really ridiculous, and he had very straight hair as well. So that's when it started, in 76 is when I started to, um, to think about just what it would be like and then through going to college and being around a, a lot of kids my age, uh, people were showing up and I liked the way they looked, I liked what they were doing and it ended up uh, revealing itself that a lot of them were in beauty school. Even though they were hanging around Ohio State where I was going to college, they were going all the way into Columbus and going to a beauty school. So the more frustrated I got in college, not knowing what I was going to do, I went to visit one day and I guess the bug bit me that I could do this, I could use my hands, I could get involved in something, I could travel the world and, uh, and, and really have a trade, another trade. And yes, my father was a barber when I was growing up. He ended up, he was a baseball player, a pro baseball player. And um, when that started to, to burn away and he got a little bit older, he, uh, he went into beauty school or barber, barber school, and I do remember for many years um, before he left us that he was a barber, and I, you know, it was, I don't think that was a driving force of why I got into it, but there was a familiarity and a comfort with um, just sort of being around guys and being around that atmosphere. Is men's grooming something you started at the beginning of your career, or was it something that kind of molded no, after I mean, you were playing? Yeah, it, it, Men's grooming didn't start at the very beginning, even though the first uh, pass was for me was at barber school and learning shaving and learning tapering and getting into uh, uh, the barbering element of everything before going into uh, uh, beauty and, and female and cosmetology and things like that. So um, it wasn't until I, I moved to the big city and started to do hair that I got more and more focused on what was happening with men. At the time, it was in the uh, mid 80s, so at the time, there was just a lot of focus on women, a lot of focus on uh, you know, that sort of cover work. And, and men, it, it, they hadn't come into their own then. They were sort of, um, they were there, and there were magazines promoting that stuff, but there just wasn't an excitement, at least in a large salon atmosphere in the big city where a lot of people were doing men's hair. So I got asked a few times, do you wanna take this uh, magazine shoot? Do you wanna do this cover? And I said, sure. And the more that I took those jobs, the more I was working with athletes and models, and then uh, from there it turned into celebrities, and then it was celebrity photographers. From there it went into even American or world icons, and that's when the word grooming sort of became uh, evident of what I was doing. I wasn't, I wasn't um, necessarily trying to shock people, but I was just taking care of men at these different levels, certainly getting into celebrity and getting into uh, iconic men and trying to just give them this comfort zone and dust off and look at exactly what they needed to be comfortable in front of the camera. And then I started to relate that to, that's what I do in the chair every day, I mean, male or female, we're giving confidence to our clients and we're doing what they need, whether it's a little bit off or a complete makeover to feel really good about themselves. And 
um, give them the confidence they need to go back to work, to go into a boardroom, to go on a date, to, um, in the case of shoots, in front of a camera, on stage, whatever it may be. So that's where grooming uh, started to happen because I was doing more than just cutting hair. It was looking at somebody's skin, it was looking at their eyebrows and not sending them out on camera where we got this beautiful haircut and he's got way too much hair growing in his ears or he may have eyebrows that are looking a little bit crazy and having to address those kind of things. And with men, when you start to address those things, the loyalty is incredible because they need somebody to do that and they need a safe place to do it and it usually happens in the salon in the chair. And when you take charge of that, suddenly they there's more questions that start to pop up, like what do you think of this belt, you know? Where did you get your shoes? The jeans are fitting great. What should I do with the color of my hair? Should I'm thinning, what should I do about that? And there's a trust level of communication that I discovered um, became this portal of information, not only for me to ask questions throughout all of these years, 30 plus, uh, about what men need to, to, to get through the day and, and sort of arrive with their grooming needs quickly, but also for them to ask questions about how they get out of these little traps and how do they look their best given some of the circumstances that they're, they're facing. So I guess it's a big answer to what you said, but that's where, for me, that's where grooming um, became defined. It was more than just skin, hair, shaving. It was really looking at a man and before he got up to do whatever he was doing, or a woman, and give them the confidence they need to move on. So, um, yeah, that was a really big answer for the question. So <laughs> I'm actually going to break it down a little bit. So w you had mentioned something about doing photo shoots. Now, like, how long were you doing hair before you even got to the point of being asked to do photo shoots? Because that's, I mean, that's a whole career path in itself. It correct? is. And it, it was a couple of years. It was a couple of years of assisting some, um, some iconic names in the industry that still exist today that I, I admire like crazy. But um, it was a couple of years, and then you either you either start to feel like you want to do that, or you don't. And um, and it is it's tricky. You oh. get especially when it comes to female. There's so much work as you as you hone that craft and you become the best of what you can be in a city like New York, uh, London, Paris. That you've got to make a decision. Like, do I want to be behind the chair? Do I want to try to do both of these things? Or is that really what I want to do? Is that my calling? With men. The, the demand isn't there quite as strong with uh, the amount of beauty work that happens. So I've been able to kind of play in both of those fields, behind the chair as well as, as going out and doing um, editorial work. We have a question from the audience. Did your experience grooming men on set help you to create the line? Yeah, because uh, it, it also just echoed what guys in the chair were asking me. So if it was a shaving question or a hair product application question, um, it came up in both places. I was asking questions behind the chair as well as I was when I was working on How would you want to look today for this picture? Um, and then things would come out like, I can never get my hair to lay down properly. Or uh, there's not something out there that I can put in my hair that looks the same way at six o'clock at night that it did when I applied it at nine o'clock in the morning. Something happens, it changes, why? And really being specific about some of the frustrations that guys have. And even though they might not be schooled in, in terminology or, or um, some of the, the way products are put together, they know what works for them and they know when, when things change and they, they end up with um, a different look that they intended. Yeah. What are some of your favorite V76 products that you use every day? Uh, tonic is a great cutting lotion. It's also um, a really nice product where people can that don't wash their hair every day can get a real nice um, sort of rinse and reset of what's in the hair from the day before. So I do use a lot of tonic. It's at all the back bars in, in the uh, salon. I encourage the staff to do it. It's got a great scent to it. It's a fantastic nourishing uh, spray for the scalp, guys that are thinning. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a, a really nice comb out, not too thick product that a lot of people can use. So that, that's, a, that's in my arsenal all the time. And then I've got uh, V-rated wax is another one that I find a lot of doesn't change throughout the day. It does give that sort of a little bit of a luster and texture in the hair, almost like you're moisturizing the hair at the same time building it up a little bit. So that, that's become a real popular product. Those are two probably the most um, versatile products that I have in the line. Yeah, 
know, I love the rated wax. I've been using it a lot in my hair. And, you know, my yeah. hair's kind of fine. No, I can, yeah. And, um, I get a lot of lift and control out of that on my, on my hair. And I, I didn't pack it with me this weekend. And I was traveling and I used tonic spray the other morning when I got up to kind of like reconfigure my hair, reshape it. And I actually had a hold of it on the flow. Great. And David's hair, I just want a very classic taper that um, I'm, I'm not going to put a line in. I'm sort of fading this up a little bit, but because he's trying to get a little more length on top, and generally speaking, men's hair is starting to come back a little bit on the sides, I do want to take him short so I can build a little bit of weight there. It's starting to happen as his hair gets longer. So with just about every man's haircut, there is a wonderful way of just setting in a foundation at the bottom, whether it's a very low taper, whether it's something that's more of a fade that rides up to the occipital. But this is where barbering and hairdressers work can really start to show off that, uh, you know, your skills. And we've got so many different approaches of, of weight distribution that we can do that with. And in David's case, I'm just staying scissor over comb, a little bit of clipper over comb, and trying to keep some sort of a, maybe a three day grow out. Um, lived in look that's not that's not so severe that it, it in his case looks like it's painted on he's got a lot of gray mixed in there and um and that's sort of what i'm doing is just setting this foundation back here even if we are leaving it longer in the front it's always so nice to see uh, a hairdresser's work that just lays into the back and rarely if ever will you see me put a clipper down and just box all that stuff off in the back and, and take away from the artistry of doing barbering or taper work Ron, you'd mentioned something just a second ago about um, whether you're a barber or a, a cosmetologist. And, you know, people get really confused on our line items. Like, well, are you for hairdressers? Or are you for barbers? Do you, uh, where, where do they cross over at in your mind? And do you think the line was built for barbers and hairdressers? Um, anybody that wants to get into men's grooming? Like, who, who is the line for? I mean, again, you, when, I, when I think about what I've created with B76, it's, it's about reminiscent of what I've done in my career. And I started off as a barber, and I think that this, this stuff, these classic things, and barbering is one of them, will never ever go out of, out of fashion. I'll never, this type of work to set things in, to graduate into taper, that classic barbering to me is like jazz music or, or the blues or, or um, just, just classic, uh, the pomp, why, why does Elvis still look great after all these years, right? Why is he in a campaign right now? Why is Paul McCartney's hair, when it was all um, modded out, start to look good? The, the stones in the 70s are looking cool again, and how all these sort of classic things come back, but they come back with a spin on it from this year. And, and how we, could be color, it could be maybe what's happening in the crown, even though things are longer around the ear. That's where we take things apart and make them more current. But these shapes, these iconic things, you know, they, they stay through all the years and, they, and they, keep, um, they keep going. So when I think about the line of E76, is it for a barber, is it for a, uh, a hairdresser? It's really for both. And, and I don't think that you want to move on through your career without understanding what barbering means and what it's all about and the tools that are implemented to do that, whether it's a clipper or a buzzer or a razor. And it's the same with those that are afraid to pick up a clipper that are hairdressers. And what does a barber do when, when hair starts getting longer? And what does a what does a hairdresser do in the salon, a top salon, when a guy comes in and he wants a really tight fade or he wants clipper work done? And that's the opportunity: is that we're all hairdressers and we're all there to please. And for all of us, we can continue to learn. I learn every day. I'll learn something this weekend um, from people that are here that are apprentices and have cut hair a year, and, and also for people that have been doing hair for 30 plus years. So I think the key to the whole thing is to be open and to. Uh, and to know what you're good at and to know what you're not good at. And, and that's, that's what it, the education and then a lot of what we're trying to do here. So a lot of what we're doing with our education that is really bringing the barber and the cosmetology world together, right? Because we want, we want both sides to understand, but we also want them to really understand what grooming's about and how a man should look and, and, how, and how things should look and how, how they look right and how they look wrong or balanced. The vocabulary of talking to a man is, yeah. is important. You know, that He's gonna run from, from words that are like a bob, right? Or bangs yeah. or, or salons that have uh, you know, names in it that are a little bit more feminine. It's more of a challenge to get a guy into a salon that it's, it's called Little Miss or 
you know, the Pink Palace or something like that. Not that there's not really great people talented in there, but it's a challenge because of this, this vocabulary that guys are attracted to or not. So, I mean, that's, that's also a very important part of, um, of what ends up happening. So a lot of the stuff that we talk about then is really good information for people that want to get into men's grooming. Like you said, there's a lot of words. Uh, there's, you know, consultations, the way you're, uh, you know, the, the environment around you is set, correct? Yeah, and understanding, you know, the last time a guy had a haircut, which takes you right back to, and whether he was happy with it or not, yeah. which takes you right back to the, you know, understanding, first off, where, where we could go with this length. Um, sometimes he's up for a major change, and sometimes he's just looking to, uh, to go back to the way it was, but maybe with a, a shift of weight or something. What does he do for a living? Um, Sometimes he wants a, a consultation. It's just it's, it's very important, and the words you use during the consultation are very important. Don, what are you doing with his hair right now? So, with David's hair, as he requested, he wants to get a little bit more length on the top. So, adjusting weight would be the quick answer to that. You know, looking for you know where this is distributed right under the recession, and you can see there's almost like a color change there. Not only with the fading in the um, the tapering that happened here, but you know, he's got a little bit of a darker bit of hair here, so I'm looking at that. Um, I'm looking at trying to build all of this stuff up and strengthen the front where it doesn't end up becoming a wispy thing. And just following this line that gives him what he's looking for on top. When you got, when there's length on top, there's versatility. He could, he could play with this in a lot of ways. He could go pompadour with it. He could wear it very flat and very opera bound. Um, depending on what product he puts in his hair, it starts to change the, the um, the complexity and the, and the mood that he's in at the time, whether it's uh, loose and not at the beach or going out for a drink at night, uh, whether he's going to meet somebody in a boardroom and do a presentation where he wants things to be looser but a little more buttoned up. And then, he, like I said, he might be black tie sometime and want more of a luster and a sheen in his hair in which product provide him with all of these different avenues to change that up quickly. And there's, there's options when there's a little bit more length on top. The other thing with these haircuts that are short back and sides is this is where all the play happens. So think about it. You could have short back and sides, do a whole photo shoot of everything like that. Well, let's just start with the back. And then when you turn to the front, this could go flat top. It could go like a suede head, really tight and short. It could go with a pompadour. It could go with a mohawk. It could go with sort of a mod bang thing. All these different variations come to life because there's something that you've, you know, you've addressed with at the top. But it all sits on that classic thing we talked about in, uh, in the tapering in the back of uh, haircuts where all of this stuff sits on this foundation, that's where this can take off and you can move from one attitude to the next. And what gives you that is often product and what kind of products you're using, how you're putting them in, when you're putting them in, how you're applying them. If I wanted to do something very, very tight and buttoned down with David, I would grab my control bomb because of the shine that's in it and because of the, the discipline and the thickness. There's honey in that, which gives it a, almost like a complete saturation. And out of all the creams, it's the hardest one. This is our closest one to those rock hard looks that, uh, that really button up. Having said that, if he went to the opera and this dried really hard with, say, control bomb in it, he would still be able to break it up later in the evening and not have it being dusty with white um, residue or something that looks powdery and just, uh, just a little bit um, too dry. At the same time, um, V-rated wax, again, very versatile product. If you wanted a looseness to it, I would get the hair more damp, not quite so sopping wet as I would have applied with Control Balm. And I would put it in his hair and it would still behave and it would lay down for me and give me what I want. But it's not going. It's going to breathe a little bit more. It's not going to be so confining to where I'm waiting for it to dry, and I don't really want to touch my hair as much because I want to keep that look. If he had V-rated in it, which I think he's got in it now, there's a. It opens up. It breathes a little bit more. If he, you know, if he's tired and wanted to run his hand through his hair or change his part, he could do it and see how it. It sort of sits there. So there's a breathing that happens in his hair, but at the same time, there's a weight that keeps it where he just placed it. So the key when you're cutting this and a guy you know, wants to put his hands in his hair and are constantly running their hands through the hair, is that balance there? So that when he does it, is he gonna end up with, with things that are just completely out of whack and look like large growths because we haven't eliminated the weight, or we can have the length, but we need to also address what's going on in there. So when that does happen, there's a freedom that looks balanced with what's, what the, the other portions of the hair is.
And that's very important when you're cutting, that you're looking for that in the mirror. As you move things around and you get your hands in, two things happen. You understand the texture and what you're going to put in. You're having a conversation with him about how he likes to wear his hair. And you're also looking for, as a professional, you're looking for that balance. No matter if the wind blows, no matter if he runs his hands through his hair, takes his helmet off, takes his hat off, and there's a certain amount of balance that doesn't look like something is just way overweighted on one side or not, and out of, out of proportion. We have a question. What can be done to help prevent skin irritations when shaving men's beards and facial hair? Um, and a lot, of, a lot of barbers and a lot of hairdressers know this, but if you've started to shave and, and get more involved with, even as a hairdresser, dusting, you know, using a razor on the neck, there's a couple of things that you want to do. When hair is very short like this and you're just cleaning things up back here, and you want to give a guy a couple more days of, of um, that regrowth not happening. Sometimes guys will pop in and they love what, what's happening with their hair, but they just want, like a woman's getting a bang trim, they'll just want this stuff cleaned up a little bit for the weekend. Sometimes it's a little bit of dusting around the sideburns, and I can do that and I'll provide that service in between um, clients while somebody's getting shampooed. So what I like to do is use the beard oil, which is also a cutting oil, and just apply a small amount of this. And why the oil and not the shave cream? I can see through it. So I can know, I'll know exactly where I want to go to get rid of some of this that, again, will give him a couple more days of, um, of not having to worry about it because it's a little tighter than a clipper. So if you're getting involved with shaving at all, whether it's on the face or whether it's in the back and all of that, when you're dealing with the face, you're taking off a lot of dense hair. And the key to that is obviously many towels of steam, heat. You want to soften the whiskers as much as possible. Back here, these are fine hairs. And this is something that uh, if you've not used a straight razor before, you can start to get familiar with how it feels to, uh, to use a razor on the skin. It's very important that the skin is pulled tight. A man likes that when you're in control. Even when you're using a clipper, when you've got control, he likes that. The last thing you want to do is not be sure of what you're doing and, and, and certainly bounce around with something as sharp as a blade, you will cut him. So one of the ways to avoid irritation is that you've got a smooth surface. You're very focused on where you're going with that. It's treated with some sort of a lubricant, whether it's, again, it's a steam on the face, in this case, just a little light oil on the back, and then you just stay really complete to that. So you, you had mentioned you were using the beard oil. So the beard oil is also good to use for shaving it on the skin. Yeah, you get it, yeah, on the face, absolutely. So what I've often talked about is you'll use a shave cream, and many men love to use foam, and they love to use it in the shower. If you're doing that, you know, stop when you get to your earlobe, not to mess with your sideburns, right? And get whatever you want to get off when you're in the shower because you really can't see. And you get really great shaves in the shower, we all know that. But when you get out of the shower, that's why I used to call it pre and post. So this is the same formulation. The beard oil, a lot of guys were starting to use it in the beard, but it started off in the first round of packaging as my pre and post. Many like to prep the beard with an oil when they're shaving their face. I like to do it afterwards, and the reason why is because I can see what I'm doing. So now that I'm out of the shower, I've removed most of the hair on my face, I can go in and I can get all those detailed places, you know, under my jawline that I might have missed. Mm -hmm. I can see right where I want to put my sideburn in the mirror because I can see through the oil. And it works as a great post shave. It also lubricates the face a little bit, and, and we also found out that you don't even really need to rinse it off because it's such a nice formulation, a nice light formulation. I found that I, I, I have a really gray beard, and it's really, really, really coarse. So I put it on my beard to soften it, then I put the shaving cream on to shave. And the nice thing about it is, is when I do rinse out, my skin's not dry. No. It's not really dry and taut that you would get after using most shaving creams on, on really rough hair. So getting back to that original question, how do you avoid irritation, I think that prep is important, you know, and there's a clean surface. and. Uh, and that's a very important thing. The ingredients that are in these products are not clogging, that they're, they're able to be rinsed out, and if they are absorbed by the skin, they're absorbed in a very clean way, um, some of these natural oils. But uh, prep is key, and in some cases, I think um, some, sort of a, some sort of a healer afterwards, which is another thing we've been working on for the last couple of years, uh, key ingredients like aloe that, that, that heal very well. Um, so we're looking into, we're actually in the middle of doing an aftershave sort of um, 
solution that sort of satisfies any irritated skin afterwards. A very sharp blade is key. You know, you, uh, you're going to cut somebody and you're going to cause irritation if you don't have a, a very sharp blade, whether it's a Gillette blade, a Schick blade, whatever, Remington, whatever you're using, a straight blade if you go. And if anybody's ever experienced like a, um, a straight razor shave, it's very important that the blades are very, very sharp, as well as the preparation. Those are very important things. So in David's case, like I said, you caught me in the middle. There's a lot of talk about it. I've never really come on and done anything live with the Facebook before. So um, hair-wise, I'm leaving a lot of what's going on on top. I might just dust a few more things off before he's done. But I also want to address something that we talked about earlier. And there's a few devices that help me do that. And that's um, a lot of these little ear hairs. Some salons have waxing uh, facilities and guys love to have that done once a week or whenever they're coming in to have the waxing done. If not, um, there's some smaller, more finer devices that I've um, sought out to use around the nose and around the ears and thing that don't, um, the teeth are, are much finer so that you can go in and you can just start to eliminate some of these small hairs that end up in a guy's ear or a guy's nose. What? Sometimes too, if you get a guy that's very dense here, that can be something that can be used in the, in the front like that. Juan, well, how do you approach that conversation with your clients in the chair? So how I approach this um, is, is funny because often, if I see this while I'm cutting somebody's hair, nobody wants and is cultivating ear hair or nose hair, right? Nobody wants that. Just deal with it. So what I'll do at the very end of a service like for instance, if it is, you know, David's got a few hairs growing out of his nose, I know something's coming up. I'll just tilt his head back and I'll, I'll rub his nose so it doesn't tickle. And I'll just, I'll say something like, hang on a second and we'll deal with this really quick. And then just kind of wiping this off and keeping it clean. He, he's gonna love you forever for taking care of that. And it's really nothing to extend that service and create such much more of an experience. Nobody wants ear and nose hair. Eyebrows are a little bit different eyebrows I would ask him if I see something with the eyebrows that are a little bit longer uh, maybe some wild uh, gray ones that are sticking out right you want to isolate them the one thing you don't want to do is to pull this down like you're cutting his hair and just hammer that whole thing off nobody wants that so what you want to do is you want to isolate and the comb will do that some of the long hairs and just pick at them sometimes you can find them even with your fingers by moving them around and again it just extends the service of grooming him to a point where not everybody's doing this. And when you do do that for an individual, especially a guy, they love you forever. Some guys will say, leave my eyebrows alone. They'll say, my wife does it, my boyfriend does it, or I have them waxed, or I like them a little bushy. My dad had bushy eyebrows. You have to honor that simply because you're dealing with his face. Nobody wants nose hair. Nobody wants ear hair. Sometimes guys do like making a statement with their eyebrows. So if that is the case, and you've got some wild ones, I like to go to V-rated wax. This is also good in a beard. And the very small amount of this can be applied. Let's just say I'm applying it in his hair, right? And I'm working through a dime size amount in his hair and we've got all of this going on. And that's one of the last products I put in his hair is a V-rated wax. I might take what's left on my hands, knowing he likes his eyebrows a little long, but knowing they're a little bit crazy, and just go through that and get those to lie down a little bit more. Oh, that's how I can keep them from popping up all day long. Now. And some guys, even with a beard, will find that this thicker formulation, clean formulation of V-rated, um, is more effective than the beard oil. Okay. So depending on if they want a dense control in the beard or a mustache, it's not, it's not a mustache wax that's going to take it to a handlebar and leave it like that. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have anything that strong for that, and there are products for that. But in the case of combing down and wanting a little bit more substance on the beard, V-rated is a very clean, on the skin, great product for that if you want a little bit more than uh, beard oil. What ear clippers are you using? Um, this is something that I've just found online and this became very handy doing celebrity shoots and things because, again, if you're getting in there with a T-blade, sometimes if it's an older gentleman and the skin is a little bit loose, you could cut them. It'll fall into that. So um, this one is a, is a Norelco Phillips. I think they retail for... 25 bucks, 26 bucks, you're welcome Norelco Phillips. <laughs> and they can be found online, but it's just a nice little device to have in your arsenal. And when you do this, it just, again, it adds a level to the service, it cleans things up, 
and it answers a question which a lot of salons and a lot of barber shops have is like how can I get my prices up how can I how can I get my prices up with men you can do that when you start to, to get behind what you do and which a lot of you already do but you add another level of experience to when a guy comes in and sits down and you're looking at it a little bit more than just giving him this rock and haircut many of us many of you do rock and fades rock and haircuts start to look a little bit more at this individual and just take control of that and those little things start to elevate the service and um, provide you with the ability to start creeping your prices up and you're not going to lose the guy by moving your prices up and starting to think a little bit different about the word grooming versus just you know barbering the hair off or giving him a haircut and sending him out the door and especially not when you're changing your game up a little bit and taking a little bit more care of them and doing this kind of stuff like ears and nose and eyes just those little things that are so important and this can be also effective too you know if you uh, if you're not comfortable putting the um the razor on the skin and taking that down you're going to get a little bit tighter stretching the skin and going in with something that's fine on the neck as well so that's that's available too so in David's case, there's a lot of things I would finish him off with. Um, I like my latest fun thing to do is combine molding paste with B-rated wax. So I'll break this down a little bit. And I know that I'm going to get a strength from that. And then the B-rated wax is going to give me a little bit more pliability. And it also um, slow this down a little bit from setting up so quickly. So I'll mix these two. There's one cocktail I haven't thought of yet. This can be put in the hair when the hair is dry or damp. Uh, molding paste, paste generally is better when the hair is a little bit damp. I like to use V-rated when uh, it's been dried off a little bit more. But there's a, there's, now this V-rated effect is going to have a little bit more strength to it. And uh, if I wanted to, to change it up a little bit, maybe even go against the way he was parting it before and create some more movement in the, in the front. It's going to just hold that down a little bit better. If I had more questions about the products, where could I learn more online? Uh, V76.com is um, pretty thorough with uh, the breakdown of all of these different pastes and different waxes and uh, to start with. And then it's a conversation or sometimes it's uh, the salon that's selling this stuff. Again, that's where these answers are usually provided. It's a safe place to talk about all this stuff. And believe me, uh, guys do want answers to these things. Let's get them in the salon to do that instead of sending them online uh, looking for stuff, talking to people that aren't experts at it. Awesome. Thanks, Facebook. Thanks for uh, all of you that kind of sat through the last 30 minutes and uh, much appreciated. It's been a blast and it's going to keep growing. Thank you, David. Now you look good for the class today. Oh, <laughs> nice.